I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar, uh, which is seven ways to build customer relationships. I think it's going to be a fascinating, um, fascinating webinar and uh, lots of very good, um, very practical advice for everyone today. Uh, delighted to welcome uh, two speakers, regular speaker I've worked with um, for many, many years, uh, Peter Massey from Bird. Uh, thank you for joining us, Peter. Hi, John T. And uh, we've got some uh, nice polls lined up uh, during Peter's presentation. I think it's going to be proved quite insightful. And also delighted to be joined um, for his first webinar with us, uh, John Finch from Ring Central in San, uh, in San Francisco. Thank you for uh, getting yeah, up so early to join us. Happy and, to be here. Thanks for having me. And John, you're going to be looking at some of the ways that technology has a, an angle in terms of building customer relationships. Yes, yes. Yes, excited to share that. Okay, wonderful. Well, if you uh, want to watch a replay of today's webinar, uh, that will be available in uh, about an hour after the webinar has ended. Um, we're carrying on the discussion today in the chat room. Uh, the uh, quite a number of people already dialed in. So here's the link you need to follow. It is callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. So just put that into uh, another browser and then that will take you off to um, uh, take you to uh, to that site. Just put in your first name, last name, and email. And um, it does work quite well if you have the webinar slides on one side of the screen and the chat room on the other. You can see both things at the same time. And um, a couple of advantages of being in the chat room. First is that you can download the webinar slides. So once you're logged in, just follow this link here, and you can download both uh, Peter's and John's slides which would be good you can also get a transcript of the of the chat log as well uh, an added advantage that we will be giving a either a bottle of champagne box of chocolates or a gift voucher for the best tip in fact uh, here's the uh, bottle of champagne here ready to ready to go if people want that or if you prefer the gift voucher or the chocolates we can certainly ship that off uh, so if you'd like to use hashtag tip for a tip uh, hashtag question for a question i've just got an opinion uh, put it straight into there so that address as uh, ever, callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat is the, uh, if you just like to go in and log into that now. So we're gonna start off with a poll. We're gonna be talking about custom relationships. So I'd just like to uh, start off with the question about how do you measure the strength of relationships with your customers? Do you use one of these, um, what I'd call uh, traditional-ish, uh, methods to use a customer satisfaction <coughs> score, do you use something like a net promoter score, have you got on board the uh, customer emotion and measure the net emotional value, do you measure customer effort or do you not really measure the strength of your customer relationships and I often feel that some of these metrics may not uh, fully align with that so I'd just like to uh, just like to vote on which one you measure there and just close the uh, results and uh, and share these here. So Peter, we've seen that actually for measuring the strength of uh, relationships, net promoter score is proving to be the most popular uh, at 58%, followed by 50% customer satisfaction. Do you think these are yeah. sort of good pro proxies for um, custom, customer relationships? Uh, let's say so i remember uh, a colleague telling me uh, 20 years back that the best measure of uh, the strength of a customer relationship is how much they spend and uh, i think that's kind of a you know one extreme if you like the the end of it but at the same time a lot of the, the there's a whole industry now around nps and csat and so on and so forth and um it, it's not linear in terms of the relationship between those kind of scores and the strength of the relationship so if by strength you mean how long people will stay for how much more money they'll spend with you how much advocacy they give you etc cetera, etc cetera, you know there are there are different parameters over and above any one factor so i think i think the real issue here is that one can't just say we're okay at any point according to a score one's got to look at what's behind the scores all the time and look for the factors driving those scores. That's that's the common factor across any of these measures. Yeah, and certainly that's uh, you know I think it's human nature to like to have one score that uh, that says it all. But uh, life is much more uh, much more nuanced than uh, than that. So that probably is quite a good time then, Peter, to uh, 
line up and if you'd like to take us through some of your thoughts on uh, uh, on the ways to build uh, build relationships certainly i think um spend ultimately that's what you're trying to achieve at the uh, end of the day i guess in any relationship with a customer well it, it can be it's it's not it's not the total picture for for every company in that sort of way but it's interesting to have a look at the correlations between um mm. good relationships great relationships and what it does economically. Uh, I've only ever seen one business actually model that in any detail, because as I say, it, it's non-linear. Um, you, can, you can make a big difference in the middle range and not affect the scoring, where, sorry, you could affect the scoring strongly in the middle, not affect the spend. Whereas at the top end and the bottom end, you can affect spend more strongly. So it, it's quite a complex area, worthy of a webinar mm -hmm. in its own right. So let me let me bash away at um, some of the material in here then. So just a quick slide, you know, lots of companies we deal with. Um, what do we do? We're a customer experience consultancy. Uh, my particular passion, as you know, John T, is how do we stop doing dumb things to our customers and our people? Um, easy to say, hard to do in large scale businesses. Uh, typical example here of the, the zero bill that's sent out to a customer. Um, you know, just, just silly things which get in the way cause work, make me ring them, you know, it creates contact. A very good illustration of the kind of thing we talked about just before we started. Um, what I'm going to cover today, I, I'm sort of cheating a bit really here because, um, you know, it gets to seven ways, you run out of, uh, of, of ways to count this stuff. But I wanted to just to say a few words about great customer relationships and uh, how old the subject is, obviously. Uh, we'll go through four elements, basics before delight, get rid of the dumb stuff choose the right customers, and then being the customer. And I'm going to illustrate being the customer using a, a particular methodology, uh, which is uh, what you use to build great relationships. So just a, a quick thought on great customer relationships. I started by looking for, um, you know, Harley Davidson is, is one of those companies that people say is legendary in this respect. Um, it's, it's the one company where people actually tattoo the brand onto their bodies. So it has a fantastic relationship with its customers and it has these hogs, the Harley owners groups, which are a key component of the sales and experience that people have at Harley Davidson, uh, where the president of the um, Harley Davidson hog um, group for any particular franchise is actually the owner of the franchise. So uh, the guy on the right here, Philippe Tisserand, is a, a former colleague of mine who, uh, followed his passion. He'd always had a Harley Davidson and uh, about five years ago, well, just over five years ago, he decided to uh, change camp and actually went and won himself a Harley Davidson franchise. This is him and his son celebrating the fifth anniversary. And they've done some amazing things around building great relationships. They're very, very um, successful um, Harley franchise, great relationships with the customers. And uh, we had him come in and do a talk for some of our customers recently. and. Uh, you know, the most basic thing he talked about was saying hello to everybody who walked through the door. So great customer relationships start with people. And um, it, it's people to people. And I, the other thing I love about this photo, it, it shows a great relationship between father and son. The every relationship, customer relationships are human to human relationships. It doesn't matter who the, who the people are, it comes down to great conversations between people or starting with hello. So this quest, if you like, for great relationships is, is as old as time. It's something which is innate to the human psyche and to the way that we all want to interact with people. It's not about interacting with a brand, it is interacting with people. Um, but it's complicated, you know, people are complicated. Customers change their minds. Customers don't always know what they want. And as the cartoon illustrates underneath, customers can be a bit tricky from time to time so it's not a simple thing when we're dealing with what is really psychology rather than technology uh, that, that makes up relationships and of course you know a lot of our methods in in management are about evidence uh, analysis thinking critically we're actually the way that people's brains work it's not always that linear not that simple um, and certainly now we're starting to see the emergence of people who are coming from a psychology background or a neuroscience background, starting to make quite large impacts in terms of, see the marketing end of the scale to start with, but running right through into the science of 
what happens with customers and the, what are the reasons customers react in the ways that they do. Um, it is complicated, um, and this is just one of those uh, little illustrations you can use to show how complex your brain is. If you look at the, the boxes down, down below, you can see each of those boxes is either coming out of the page or going into the page, depending on the way that your, your brain flicks between the two. And um, our, our brains are, are complicated things that, that, that are essential to the way relationships work. And of course, we're trying to form great relationships in a digital world. So I'm talking about people interacting with people, but people interacting with machines is progressively starting to become, um, you know, the core area that we're working in, let alone as we go forward into AI and we start having real interactions with um, machines, which can, I'll use the, the word think, uh, but can certainly interact in the way that humans do. So, so my four points really to get going on are um, in, in the way that uh, we work as people, it's really important to think about basics before we think about building delight into our relationships. Can you delight a customer if you're not be meeting the basic expectations? So if you put a bunch of flowers on the car seat when you deliver a car, but it's got a scratch in the back, you know, you're not gonna get anywhere. It's really important to understand basic expectations. And this is uh, something going back to the 80s, it's called a Carnot diagram, which is something which is, um, looks a little bit complicated to start with, so let me try and explain. We've got here the basic must-haves, which sit below this performance line. So a basic must-have on line one is something which, if you get it completely right, at best, it's just gonna meet expectation. You're never gonna get it beyond the line. Um, three here, the delighters, things which, are only ever gonna please people, but are gonna please people more, the higher they go. And then you have the middle one, the, the linear performance, things where more is good and less is worse um, in those kind of factors. So the little stars on here are just to illustrate, you know, um, interactions with customers or stories customers have. Um, there, there are specific ways to look at those and say, it is what we're trying to do going to just get us to the basic expectation or is it something that can delight us? But more importantly, have we fixed all those basic things before we start investing in all the delighters? And this is a really key discussion between customer service people and marketing people. A really important discussion to have in the boardroom that says, look, where's the spend going? If you start looking at where's all the money going, it's often going down the marketing budgets but if you've not got the service right, then that marketing budget can be wasted. So mm -hmm. there's a really good debate to be had around the boardroom that says, hang on a minute, if we move some of that budget into getting rid of basic problems, then those exciters and delighters can be more, more useful. So typical example here of, of how you can use this kind of stuff. Across the piece here, we've got a typical journey. Uh, this is a restaurant example. You know, do we consider the restaurant? Do we, do we try to find it or get a contact? We can't find that contact. We can't get the answers we want. We finally get the answers we want. We find the options we book. We change something. We go through, experience the restaurant, recommend it, like it, come again, whatever we might do. Along that journey, which is replicated here along the middle, <coughs> there are steps in that journey where we can only reach the middle line. We can only meet an expectation. We can't exceed it very easily. And there are some steps where we can exceed it. And what's important is to look at the pain points and opportunities along that journey and say, actually, are we trying to, uh, to, to work in the right areas? Have we got rid of those negative? We're trying to move up the line and get onto some of the parts of the story where we can be more positive in that way. So point two then is get rid of the dumb stuff. It follows from those Carnot diagrams that we're, we're gonna waste a lot of time building relationships if we're breaking them all the time with the basics. So typical dumb stuff, but I mean, obviously you'll see examples all over the place. This is a parcel delivery, 16 digit reference number. You uh, click on the link and it shows you to track my parcel from that link. Uh, what comes up is asking you for the tracking number, which is that 16 digit number. It's on your mobile phone. You've got to flick between the two applications. You don't get the benefit this screen has, where you can see both screens at uh, both screens at once. You've actually got to type a 16-digit number across. 
chances of doing that very limited um, and getting it right is very hard so it's it's an obvious case where something better could be done now that kind of stuff is happening to us all the time we've become numb to it um, but businesses like Amazon have made an industry out of getting rid of the dumb stuff and people like First Direct just don't do silly things as much as possible you're in the situation where you are not having to cope with those those things that you would rather not have and um, the, the book on the left here written by my colleagues in um, Seattle and, and Melbourne the title the best service is no service was the answer that Bill gave to Jeff when he was interviewed for the customer SVP job at Amazon uh, quite a few years back now and he said no no the, my philosophy towards customers is the best service is no service people don't want to have to get in touch with us and going back to the question earlier on we talked about headroom this is where you can start start with understanding the customer around challenging it and eliminating the dumb contacts and that's how businesses like Amazon um, have grown so successfully because they've managed to create the feeling of a relationship just by removing all of the dumb stuff and this is really one of the complex things if you never speak to people at Amazon and you never do you, you know very rarely do you have a problem that you need to get get hold of them on um, then how do they build that feeling of relationship but it's there it works again the complexity of psychology my third point is choose the right customers so we see a lot of businesses who are in the situation of um, trying to handle customers who are not matched to uh, the proposition that they've got really important because the customers in control today you know we talked earlier on about the um, problem of um, having um, too many situations where the customer cannot do what they want to do and customer relationship management it used to be called CRM systems are, are very much an example of something that's changed because customers are managing relationships a lot of the time customer managed relationships in that sense were the ones with control TripAdvisor uber were rating things down to this is a, a singaporean site for rating your doctor hospital etc so people can go in and have a look what's going on the customers in charge so matching your proposition to the right customers is very important and that can be done in in many ways but i'm just going to illustrate two one by understanding the type of customer the behavior of the customer the passions of the customer the uh, the ones that you can see on the, uh, on the left of the screen here or secondly by thinking about the type of behaviors and, and spending that those customers have got now to illustrate those two types of thing this is um oatly um a, a milk substitute which is made by a swedish company and you can see just from the headline we promise to be a good company you know some really basic messaging quite light-hearted, um, quite jovial, and it's appealing to the brand of people, uh, the type of people who like this, this brand and are gonna fit in well with its proposition. Or in this case, this is a, a car rental company, is trying to think more through the science of it and say, okay, what kinds of customers are we dealing with? This column down here, individual business, travel agents, corporate government, some of them are passive, some of them are contracted, some of them are discretionary. So what you're trying to do for those customers is different. Is different. We're going to need different people dealing with those people, and we're going to have to match what we're doing with customers to the way that we interact. So choosing the right customers, giving them the right service to the, the right proposition, absolutely essential to get this stuff to work. And then fourthly, um, being, being the customer. How do we approach the subject from the customer's perspective? So these words b2c or b2b you may be a company which is dealing with consumers business to consumer or business to business uh, b2b the lens that you look through will will be one or the other perhaps in that way but i want to suggest a third lens going back you know we talk about this stuff being as old as the hills well this is a book written in 99 a guy called alan mitchell back in uh, that time in 2000 we had a group running thinking hard about this problem um, where marketing and sales typically are seller side thinking they are business to consumer business to uh, business in that sense whereas in fact even back as far ago as that we were thinking very hard about buyer side thinking when the buyer becomes in control of what's going on how is that going to change things 
and his book Right Side Up was well ahead of its time in terms of trying to think that through. So that third lens, which lens do we look through, is um, for us, we call it me to be. Um, so actually putting yourself in the shoes of the customer, <coughs> excuse me, the me to be. So how can you, as a business, think through um, any problem from the point of view of if I were the customer, then this would be experienced as me to be, not B to C in that sense and not B to B. So uh, again, same colleagues, Bill and David uh, wrote a second book in 2015 based on quite a lot of the same um, ideas. And in that they did a lot of research into what are the needs that customers have? What are the relationship needs? And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time looking at those. So if you want to act for the customer, to be the customer, these seven relationship needs are extremely useful in looking at problems. So here we go, emotional needs at home, work, customers, we're all human, so these seven factors can equally well apply. You know me, you remember me, you give me choices, you make it easy for me, you value me and listen to me, you trust me, you surprise me with stuff I can't imagine and you make me better and do more, you make me able to do more in that way. And these factors are the factors out of the research that we found in relationships be, which were great relationships, these were the parameters that were being um, examined in people's heads and being felt in the experiences that were, were going on. Uh, John, did you want to butt in at this point or? Uh... Yes, yeah, so we're going to do a, a poll now. And what we want to do is we'd like you to um, uh, answer the question, do you agree on a scale of one to five with the following statement? So we're going to start with everyone has a relationship with a bank. So does your bank know me and remember me? So on a scale of one to five, where five is strongly agree and one is strongly disagree, does your bank know you or remember, uh, and remember you? So just uh, we'll show the results here. So what we're seeing there is, generally speaking, it looks like banks not doing a particularly great, uh, great job there. Um, we're gonna do a similar, um, question now and we're going to ask the same how much does your bank make it easy to do uh, uh, so do you agree with the statement my bank makes it easy for me so just same question scale of one to five does your bank make it easy for you to deal with so uh, let's have a look at the uh, results that are coming through here and Peter there's um, quite a different uh, score coming in to this one I'll just close <coughs> that off now so uh -huh. perhaps where people felt the bank didn't know them, the bank does make it easy to, to deal with. I guess transactions are, are generally quite straightforward. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people don't talk to their banks anymore. Um, so actually the transactional nature is really quite important. Okay, so that's, <laughs> that's quite good. Now let's have a look at another one. And um, the, uh, the question on this one is, uh, on a scale of one to five, do you agree with the statement, uh, the bank, um, surprises me with stuff I can't imagine. I guess surprise here is in a positive way rather than in a negative way. So does your bank surprise you with stuff you can't imagine? I don't know if anyone has signed up for any of one of these uh, new startup banks like Monzo. Um, have you been surprised by your bank in a positive way of late? So I'll just share the results um, here and um, this is probably, Peter, the lowest of the scoring we've had here, that um, yeah. actually only 19% of the audience would sort of somewhat agree with that statement about being surprised. Yeah, uh, it's, it is quite interesting, isn't it? I, I'm a Monzo user and, and the app, I discovered on my, my app the other day that um, the, the number of times I visit our community shop and our local pub is very surprising. <laughs> and, uh, I don't really expect Bank to be able to tell me that, but um, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's a useful surprise or not, but it, it's, a, it's an illustration. Yeah, certainly. I, I've also signed up for Monzo and uh, I got a message after I got back from uh, Italy on Monday that said how much I'd spent when I was across there, which uh, certainly that had surprised me. Uh, I, again, it wasn't particularly a great surprise, but uh, I did have a good time across there. So. Uh, um, so I think there's some real good, um, real good food for thought amongst some of those uh, questions. And then perhaps Peter, if you'd like to put up the whole list of those 
those questions. Yeah. So, I mean, I suppose this is the point, and you could try this out on your uh, partner or your boss uh, later on, if you like, um, is that, you know, whatever the scoring uh, system, it doesn't really matter. But you, we talked at the very start about the way we measure relationships. This is one of the ways that we look at relationships from a customer's perspective and say, okay, how well is a business doing at these seven factors and where would we score them? And it's quite interesting then if you get your team to do this is to, um, you can look at the difference in perceptions that your management team has or your board has about how well you're doing on these different factors. And the debate that you can cause by just getting them to, you know, very quickly, top of the head, just score how you think you're doing uh, can be very powerful indeed. So, you know, an illustration, we've, we've talked about one illustration. Uh, here's another one I use about, you surprise me with stuff I can't imagine, is that you'll see very small writing here, snowing minus one. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very cold day. I still find it really, really uh, amazing that they'll let me look through the traffic cameras and I can check and see that there is no traffic jam, there is no snow, and actually it's okay to get to the airport. You know, something like that is, is a really nice uh, surprise in that way. Now, of course, below each of those seven points is the first three. There are a range of factors. So I'm not going to dwell on those, but again, we have a sort of 49 point system for looking at the different parameters. Um, we use this both in terms of evaluation of relationships, but also in terms of um, creativity. How do we look for ways of increasing the creati creativity if it's required? Um, another couple of examples of this, have you surprised me with stuff I can't imagine? I still find it really surprising that for the price of one airline ticket, because I fly every week, uh, for the price of one airline ticket, I can get allocated seating, you know, I can uh, drop my bags, I can take two bags through, I get fast track security and speedy boarding. And it costs me about 120 quid or so for the year. Now, when you're flying that much, it's, it's an amazing value. It's so valuable on every trip. It's really, really fabulous. Yet at the same time, if I look at you make it easy for me, you know, I've spent uh, an hour today trying to renew my EasyJet Plus uh, which won't renew, they've changed the number on it, um, it's been renewed, it still won't work, you know, I've spent ages on the phone, you know, it's, it's a real problem in terms of, well, you know, where do we make things easy, where do we not? My last flight on Monday, I spent half an hour waiting at the gate because my, uh, my check-in had failed, and, you know, so actually, when you call the EasyJet, you've got to make these things work. Uh, I would add that, for the most part, they're very good, but, you know, when you're called EasyJet, you've got to really concentrate on making things work well. So it's really important to look at your brand promise and say, where does this fit? So I've used this as an illustration. The orange diamonds here are perhaps not right, but they're perhaps what the marketing guys at EasyJet might say we're trying to make our brand promise. And then the purple ones are kind of my um, feeling of what I get from EasyJet against these, uh, these points. And what you can see here is the big gap is the really important one. They're really supposed to be easy and they're really not a lot of the time. And that is an important piece of where we can look at that. Okay, how can we improve the relationship? Where can we go when we start to look at the emotions of things? Down here, you could see, you surprise me, you make me better, you make me do more. I I'm not really expecting easy jet. I'm not trying to do that stuff. I'm not really expecting it from them. So it isn't really a problem that they don't score high on it. This isn't an absolute, it's not about scoring high on everything. It, it is about matching the brand expectation so that you can build good relationships from that. And as uh, we showed in the detail slides, you, we can use then a whole 49 parameters to do that imagineering with. Okay, so to sort of wrap up, there's kind of a, perhaps an important thing to maybe look at as you finish the webinar is just have a think of, with your colleagues about what, what's the amount of psychology you use in your thinking about relationships as well as the technology. It's easy to look at the technology investments sometimes, but actually one of the ratios I look at when I go into a business is how much time are they spending thinking about psychology versus thinking about technology? How much money are they putting into the psychology of this stuff versus the technology that goes behind it? Really interesting uh, startup shift that we've got now in the customer experience industry. And to recap back to where we started, this is as old as time. Um, uh, 
people who've been around the industry a while will know Simon Roncroni, quite a long time retired now. You can see these same factors being researched on behalf of one of his customers, HSBC, back in 2000. It's the same, same emotions, slightly different words, but the basic human emotions that people have got in relationships are not changing that fast. That those, those are those seven things that we need to research and really work on. Okay, so that's, that's the stuff we've, we've covered uh, just now. I um, hope that's been useful and added a few insights and you can pick up from the slide deck some ways to go. And uh, obviously really happy to take uh, questions over the email or uh, however you like to, to follow up. Thank you, John. T. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for that, Peter. Some uh, great advice there. Get rid of the dumb stuff as, as ever. Um, choose the right customers. Not all customers want a relationship. Uh, quite often, customers will just want it to be easy in a, in a transaction. And the need to look through the customer's lens. And I think that five-point scale is a, is a great way of um, uh, doing a sort of quick benchmark of how well you're looking through the uh, looking through the customer's uh, lens. Let's have a jump uh, to the uh, chat room and have a look at some of the questions and tips that have come through. Uh, Dennis has said that the trick to build custom relationships uh, in meeting client needs and exceed, uh, the trick to build custom relationships, uh, meeting client needs and exceeding them slightly. Sometimes the client can be in a hurry or just doesn't want to become your friend, which I think Peter was a point that you made. It's a matter of respecting and meeting expectations this implies being able to identify those who want to go beyond the transaction. Peter, I think that was more or less uh, the point you were you were making. Yeah, I think I think the issue is uh, you can look at this as a in any single interaction is the tuning in that a person's got to another person, and you can look at it systemically about the brand, the whole company, and the way in which it's positioned. But certainly, you you can't when you start looking at any of the basic psychology expectation is absolutely paramount in the basic psychology of what's there. If I tell you something's going to cost 100 quid and I'm going to do it for 80, that's different from if I say to you it's 20 but I'm going to you know, give you four for 80. The, the way numbers work in your head, the way that the, the basic psychology works, fascinating subject, loads and loads of books in, in, in that area, but uh, slow thinking, fast thinking, um, is, is probably one of the most famous books in that area with some fabulous material, very rich. And Ashley has uh, got a, a point here, which I guess is about uh, knowing someone. When you speak with customers in person, ask about their interests, concerns, as well as what's working and not working for them uh, with respect to your business. Remembering customers' name, family members, and other details can go uh, a long way. Certainly, you know, I've seen it in travel insurance rather than just saying, you know, where, where are you going? Um, to actually, uh, you know, engage in a conversation about the about the destination can often uh, a simple technique. Um, uh, and um, John, I don't know if you've got a thought on this uh, tip. Sangeeta said, embed your emotional intelligence in your talent screening and acquisition tools, and uh, include emotional intelligence elements in your in your interviewing. Yeah, I mean, I think as you're as you're looking for uh, agents to sort of interact with customers, I think it's key to get somebody who actually wants to drive towards providing amazing customer service. And I think if you can if you can pull that out during an interview process, I think that's great. I think at the at the same time, uh, there's a lot of tools that are in place as you hire people to sort of train and educate, and then do ongoing quality management and quality training around the product, around how to interact with the customer, things like that. So some of those tools are, are available in different technologies that sort of allow you to, to do that, um, even if you've hired someone that, that you know, may not have this at the onset. Indeed. Laura's asked the question uh, which came up in the, in the first poll, what is the uh, net emotional value? Peter, do you, um, do you have a, a sort of answer on a postcard for that? I think we've left, lost Peter's audio. Sorry, we'll see on me. Can... Yeah, I was going to ask the same question. Uh, I've not seen that one before. What is it? Uh, as far as I'm uh, aware, a net emotional uh, uh, value is a um, is a bit like a net promoter score, but about how uh, emotionally uh, aligned you are with uh, with customers. We'll see if we can find an article on that and pop that into the uh, 
pop that into the uh, into the chat room. Uh, Jose has said, uh, exceed expectations. One of the best ways to build a strong relationship with the client is to develop a reputation as independent professional who will de deliver exceptional results. I think that's a, a very good one there. Marco says, build trust in the first place. Interact with customers on a daily or weekly basis, depending on ne ne necessity, and make sure issues are addressed and fixed as soon as possible. And when there are no issues, keep your interaction alive. That will be demonstrate that you uh, that you care. And we've had a uh, an opinion in from Ashley on the polls in the final poll uh, section. We have banks are now more automated, less than therefore less personal. Technology used more often for managing these transactions. I guess that that scores in a way, Peter, with the fact that they make it easy to deal with. Perhaps don't know people, but the surprise element, I think, is is still one that they could probably work on. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, I, I bank with HSBC and I, I went into the branch for the third time in 18 years the other day. I mean, I just don't, I don't want to talk to people at the bank. I don't want to have anything to do with the banking. I don't want to borrow any money. I don't want, you know, so my, my need, I'm the wrong segment. You know, I'm, I'm not somebody you need to do something with to generate a relationship. As long as you don't interact with me, I'm just got, not going to move. So, you know, sometimes one's got to think through what type of segment you're dealing with and what is the, the best strategy. Relationships are not the best thing for every business and every segment. Indeed, and, and on the subject of uh, technology, that's probably a good cue to uh, uh, bring John into the, uh, into the conversation now. And um, John, I know you've got some views on, uh, on the way that technology can help us with uh, improving relationships with customers. Perhaps if you'd like to yes, put slides on the screen. Yes, definitely. Uh, let me see if I can get this up really quick. Let me know if there's any difficulty on your end seeing my screen. We can see that now. Yeah. Excellent. So, in in terms of that, let's let's go through <clears throat> let's go through some of the changes that that we're foreseeing and sort of dovetailing on what Peter's been talking about. But you know, in reality, what we're seeing and what we're all experiencing is the rules for customer engagement really have changed, right? Customers expect their interactions with their brand that they're doing business with really to be effortless, right? And they also expect that to be something that can be handled across any channel. So as I first mentioned, when we opened up, I mean, you know, being able to communicate in, with your customers in a way that they want to be communicated with is key and vital, especially as the technology in the hands of the consumer continues to evolve. And, you know, in many cases, outpaces what we're doing in the business world. We just kind of keep up. And it really is, Peter touched on this too, it's a really around, you know, customers and the human side of this, right? It's about uh, being heard, right? Making people feel like they're being heard. And it also is a part of this balance of like, you know, the banking example, <clears throat> if Peter doesn't want to, you know, have a loan and his relationship with HSBC is different in his mind, the bank <clears throat> needs to also be aware of that, right? So. If the customer wants to be heard, if they do show up in the branch or they do make a phone call for a small thing, that's key, right? The other piece of it too is it's just like Amazon's example um, early on that Peter mentioned as well. I mean, you know, there are cases where people do have difficulties and issues where the wrong things get shipped, but actually being able to route those interactions potentially to an agent that solved a problem for a specific customer or for you um, and better than anybody else ever could having those relationships almost as a one-on-one -on -one becomes your relationship with Amazon. But again, it's the human connection. It's between you and that one person now that sort of has become your agent that's solving your problems. And it betters, it betters your um, perception as a customer of what Amazon is, even when there is a rare problem. Um, so I'm going to start off with way number five. Um, and Really what it is, is, is the rules have changed, right? Um, you need to think differently as, as, a, as a business, as you're looking at technology, and it really has become customer driven. It's, it's no longer driven by the business. And so this is a little bit about what that means, right? So there's the then and now. It's, it's company centric back in the day. Um, so the old way was, you know, hey, we have customer service from nine to five. That's it, it's East Coast time uh, in the US. 
or it's a time zone that is a little bit less appropriate for you as a customer. And so you have to make do with when we're, we're available. It really runs around, around traditional channels. So obviously voice was the way contact centers or call centers were, were introduced into the world. Um, relevant at the time, email sort of crept into that and now web chat as webs become relevant across the world. But now we have other channels, right? So it's any digital channel and then any digital channel 24-7. Um, and it's reactive, right? So there's a lot of this, like, don't touch me unless I've got a problem. And then the problems only come in. But every once in a while, it might be nice to hear from that company and say, hey, how are things going, right? And if you don't need anything, boom, you, you, you stop the discussion right there. And it could just be actually through a text message. It could be through um, a mobile app that you're using from the bank or whatever it is, right? Radar customer service. Just checking in with the customer to get a little bit of a litmus test and be more proactive around it. Then there's this whole thing about fragmentation, right? So the siloed customer service organization and disconnected from the rest of the enterprise and really getting to like, hey, you know, the whole organization should really be customer centric. And so driving that change in that behavior across the organization to think like an Amazon, right? to make it frictionless, make it effortless, make it something that's easy to do business with. And that sort of becomes the culture of the organization. And it becomes this thing, thing of service to many. So how can we handle tens of thousands of phone calls or emails to, hey, how can we provide an individualized experience for every single person that comes in or contacts us to solve their specific issue? Can we know who this customer is and effectively kind of handle what it is that they're contacting us about and then making it time, you know, time consuming to the effortless, right? I mean, it's, it, that's the whole narrative here. So, you know, this is an obvious thing, right? So customers have gone digital and I think that the proliferation of, of mobile devices or smartphones across the globe, you know, is something that becomes, you know, a change in the whole environment, right? So people now have multiple ways they can communicate with you through messaging, through web-based applications, through the web, through phone calls, through chat, whatever it might be. You want to be able to handle these. And, and this will continue to evolve over time. This isn't, this isn't the end of this evolution. You bring, you bring these, all these things together, like from a voice call to social media interactions, live chat, you know, email interactions, in-app messaging, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where does it stop? Like, how do you give a solid, singular, one-to-one -one experience to a customer now? And, and what organizations are involved here? You know, we've got social media outreach that's happening from the marketing inside of an organization. How then is that handled by the customer service organization when somebody comes back in and says, hey, I have a customer service issue. You guys reached out to me, so now I'm ready to interact with you. How do you handle that? How does your in-app message that you rely on to do business and upsell also handle customer service so a customer doesn't have to make a phone call on top of interacting with you on a mobile app? So all sorts of things start to become in question as to how you can solve these problems. So being able to sort of focus the whole company on customer service is my way number six. And it sort of is leveraging what you have from a technology perspective inside your organization. It's taking things like unified communications, which is the phone system inside the organization. It also could be the collaboration solution inside the organization. So folks are using Slack or you know, team messaging applications and things to communicate internally. Why can't those things then come over to how those individuals inside the organization interact with customer service representatives and or customers directly? And then you want to really be able to solve those issues faster for the first time, right? That's the big issue. So, as I mentioned earlier, sort of bringing these things together, unified communications and con uh, customer or contact center as a service together sort of brings this total um, organizational focus to the customer. And so it's not only the individuals that are in the back office that are running in the contact center, but it's also individuals that are inter interfacing with customers. But it's also then inter individuals that can sort of escalate it where needed issues to be resolved that are a little bit more technical in nature or, you know, challenges that may be one-off 
challenges that a customer may have when they contact you, but allowing that agent to interact with knowledge workers or other experts within the organization to solve those problems and or bring them into the conversation in real time, like with a video meeting or, um, a, you know, just a, a, a share of information or documentation in real time ultimately helps to solve the problem quickly and efficiently. And then the customer isn't having to contact back the organization to get that problem solved. In addition to that, you know, collaboration really is the key to this. And, and so we see a lot of things um, from our perspective where organizations now allow uh, agents to communicate through team messaging applications to get this information and share it in real time. So knowledge workers are actually a part of the teams that are collaborating with the agents and sharing documentation and information and best practices and being able to message someone while you're on a phone call or while you're chatting with a customer in real time to get an answer rather than having to dig through a knowledge base or, or call a customer back or, or have yet another poor interaction with the customer. So all of these things become important as well as the CRM integration. So being able to leverage and utilize your salesforce.com or any other CRM application within your organization to sort of centralize those customer communications and understand who your customer is and why they may be contacting you. This is the example that sort of brings that together is Ring Central has what we call Glip Team Messaging. And so it actually brings together the contacts in our agent directly with the rest of the organization and vice versa and allows this communication to occur in real time and thus provides this best of breed customer interaction and then brings sort of the customer forward thinking across the entire organization. So let's go to way number seven, and it's really about thinking digital first. And I think that this, this is sort of what excites me the most when we start talking about customer interactions, just because I'm sort of a technologist and, and you know, voice communications, albeit extremely important and will never go away. I think the way that we want to be able to interact in today's, you know, modern era with these mobile devices is, is really to hear and communicate with each other and the brands that we communicate with as easily as we do with each other. So I like to use the phrase sort of as easy as messaging a friend. So being able to take from whatever medium and mode that you are communicating in, so via messaging, so text messaging or SMS, um, social media messaging, uh, live chat coming to a brand's website, review sites, um, email, mobile applications that you might have uh, from your brand to your customers, and even other elements that we haven't yet thought of, right? So there's a whole number of things that get launched every day, and uh, we wanna be able to handle those as they come in to the mix and be able to address those from a customer service perspective. And what, what we're doing here from a technology perspective with, with our product called Engage Digital is being able to aggregate all of these interactions and intelligently route these to the right agents across the globe that can interact and provide a digital experience. Um, and this will continue to proliferate, right? I mean, I think at the end of the day, this is what is amazing to me is that the biggest consumer brands like Apple and Google and Facebook and WhatsApp really are sort of driving this sort of behavior. So by having Apple, for example, launching in its next OS, which I think is out later this month, the ability now not only just to make a phone call or tap a link to be able to get directions to a specific business, but also being able to directly message them from the OS. And so on the other side of that, how do you interact with a customer that's gonna message the brand? You need a technology like ours here to be able to do that interaction in an efficient way, because if it's not Apple only, you've also got Google doing the same thing. So it's no longer about just maps and making a phone call or seeing the website of the business. It's also being able to directly message them at that very moment. And same with WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger, being able to message to those businesses directly from those um, applications to be able to get information about their hours of operation or ask them a specific question about you know, a, a, a type of uh, item that you're interested in purchasing and seeing if they have it available. So this will continue to be, you know, from a consumer to business messaging sort of push that we will continue to see. And as these continue to evolve and are adopted more and more in the consumer world, 
the necessity for the business to actually be able to handle these becomes more and more important. And that's not just a one-off thing where you have access to one application. You have a person sitting in an office from nine to five answering these interactions. Again, back to the beginning, it's 24 seven, 365, and it's understand me as the customer, no matter which channel I may be coming in at. So in terms of just looking at uh, customer engagement across the board from a Ring Central perspective, we sort of have these three pillars that we, we build and, and develop everything that we do um, into market. We look at it from an effortless perspective. So as I mentioned, the collaborative component, really driving digital and really making it you know, easy and simple for our customers to provide better customer service to their customers. Intelligent from the perspective of looking at the latest and greatest technologies from artificial intelligence to being able to route interactions appropriately, um, being able to provide proactive customer insights in real time to really provide that one-to-one -one sort of relationship to the business and the brand. And then open. So this really means the ability to um, adopt technologies and integrate technologies that may be useful inside the organization that they're already using, for example, chatbots and other things where it's sort of the digital labor to human labor sort of balance that would be necessary to handle the number of interactions and being able to integrate with those different chatbot applications that may be out there that folks are using as well as develop their own application. So there's a lot of workflows and specific things that organizations do need in order to really be, be relevant in their specific industry. So being able to handle all of those and ensure that our customers can develop as, as that continues. So with that, that's, that's uh, all I have at, at the moment uh, in terms of slides. I guess I'll pass it back over to you and uh, we can take some questions and, and sort of go from there. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, John. I think some uh, very good uh, words of wisdom there. The rules have changed. Uh, so instead of saying we've got 100, uh, we've got 100, uh, 10,000 calls today, how can we provide individual customer service to the to this person uh, contact? Yeah, so I think it's great. Uh, customers have gone digital. Uh, business messaging is going to be the next big thing. And uh, certainly I, I had no idea. I mean, I've started using business messaging much more but um i had no idea that whole apple thing is coming through and i think that's going to be that's going to be huge because that's uh, i think ties in with um your uh, with the third point which is interact with customers on the channel of their choice so i think there's going to be some big technology changes uh coming through overall and uh, certainly if you'd like to see a demonstration of how some of that technology uh is changing i'm sure john can uh, arrange demonstration of the uh, Ring central system, and I guess that some of that in-app and business messaging would be uh, would be fascinating to see. So, I'd just like to um, vote on that. Uh, vote on that now. Uh, that's great. So, let's have a look at some of the top tips and questions that have uh, come through. We've had one from uh, Zahir. Uh, relationships are based on trust. Trust emerges from respect. Uh, respect is driven by empathy. Empathy requires understanding and appreciation of both the customer's physical and emotional context. I guess, Peter, you're talking about emotional context. You cannot emphasize enough to become obsessed about the customer. Uh, if, you, if you're not obsessed with your customer, your competitors will be. Certainly, Peter, there's a lot of uh, startup companies coming through that uh, uh, could, could take people's breakfast. Yeah, I, I think one of the things is you see it more and more is that the thinking of a startup company is not to build a big contact center and and do all that kind of stuff. It's kind of very much to avoid it right from the get go, and um, that that's I think you know one of the fundamentals, isn't it? That uh, the big companies are trying to compete with that, and it's difficult to, at a more general business sense, to transform when you've already got those infrastructures. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's certainly a challenging one. Certainly, we talked about the startup bank Monzo, which I think has got a brilliant app. I did click on their customer service, the um, uh, support app, and it was a two hour wait to get through for a live chat. So whether that's yeah. growing pains or again, I think they think we're going to start off with that. And before they know what's what, they're like any other uh, organization, a customer service organization. We've got a tip in from Sarah who says creating a sense of community is important. Naked Wines are a brilliant example of that. As a customer, you feel part of something by doing good by supporting smaller winemakers, having the opportunity to meet winemakers at tasting events, 
and engaging with them at other with, and with other angels in the online discussion groups. And on top of that, the customer service is amazing. If you don't like a wine, they'll refund with no questions asked. I think, um, John, that's a great example of, uh, of building relationships. Yeah, no, I would definitely agree. And this is a great example of an organization that is all about customer service, right? I mean, it really is about bringing the customer into the experience and making people feel like they're a part of what the business is. And so, you know, wholeheartedly, they're, they're involved in making sure that their angel investors feel like they're driving the company and driving the behavior. And when they do have a customer service issue, you know, it, it's, it's simple and easy to resolve. It's effortless. Wonderful. I think they uh, probably surprised some of their customers. Ashley has said, use social media as an engagement tool, but not simply as a platform. Social media such as Facebook and LinkedIn are not merely platforms connecting with people, but it also can be used as tools to gain better engagement results. Peter, uh, could you see it as a way of gaining engagement? Well, I think, I think the nature of the interaction that you um, try to go about on Facebook and LinkedIn is, is part of the engagement. So you, you, I'm sure you have the same thing. You see a whole tribe of LinkedIn posts where people are just trying to sell stuff or you get LinkedIn requests from people you don't know and you know they're in sales jobs. It's kind of like there's some very naive uses of things like LinkedIn, whereas you know people who put good content up there, ask questions, create dialogues, those are the kind of things where you're connecting with people and getting a better engagement. Um, and you know, the thinking around this kind of traditional sales bang on the door versus relationship-based selling is, is wholly different. O2 and Gift Gap is the classic comparison that people use. Gift Gap is owned by O2, it uses the same network, but everybody thinks Gift Gap provides a way better service, and that's to do with that community that they, they uh, foster. And they do that through social platforms. Mm. And Laura says, uh, I guess on a similar vein, value customers who complain. They could have just never returned to your business, but instead they're giving the choice to make it right and turn them into a happy, loyal customer. I think that's often, you know, they can be foreseen as sort of rather moaning, but actually at least they tell you what's, uh, what's happening. John, complaining customers are, are quite an asset. Yeah, they are actually, and this is this is part of the problem, right? There's a there's a number of, of social broadcast technologies that marketing uses to sort of do these things where it's advertising, but actually, you know, taking this in where people are doing, you know, these types of things where they're complaining about some interaction or they've had a bad flight or you know just a bad experience and they throw it out to their their followers, you know, having the brand be able to respond to that in a private sort of way and then turn that, that bad experience and then that customer into an advocate, I think, you know, is key. And that's, this is what these technologies can do now. And I think centralizing that into a customer service organization versus having it be a one-off where no one's ever responding, you know, is better off for the brand image as well as it is for, for you from a customer service perspective. Well, we've got a, a tip in from uh, Marco, who looks like he's got a sort of five point uh, way to build uh, Relationships, number one, build trust. Number two, communicate. Number three, ask for feedback. Number four, connect. And number five, uh, show appreciation. Um, I think that sort of connecting the, the feedback and showing appreciation is quite a nice uh, loop. I know, Peter, that um, uh, one of your bugbears in the past has always been the, you, you know, lots of companies want your feedback but actually don't do anything with it. Yeah, I think there's two problems. One is there's often more effort giving the feedback than there was in the transaction to start with. Uh, you know, they don't often make it easy. Um, you know, a classic of that, we, we bought some Hyundai cars recently and the, the feedback form comes through asking you what car you bought. You know, really simple things like that. Um, and then on the other side is that, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I've seen more than one company ever go back to all its NPS 10 scorers you know customers rate you 10 you should at least go back and say thank you you know and recognize that these guys love you mm -hmm. um it's such a powerful piece of communication that nobody plans the budget to have the time to go back and say thank you and follow it up 
Yeah, and saying thank you is uh, really quite a, a key one. Well, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. If perhaps you could uh, uh, thank us by saying what you like uh, best about the webinar. And we do review every bit of uh, feedback. Here's a thank you to the winning tip that's come through. And it's from Ashley. I think Ashley won a, a tip uh, about six weeks ago. Um, uh, Ashley's tip is use surveys, polls and questionnaires to learn about customer preferences and needs. These tools will provide important information about what customers like about your business and how it can be improved. A customer is more likely to frequent your business if they feel they are heard. Surveys, polls and questionnaires will provide, provide a voice to your customer and increase their engagement with you and your business, uh, providing uh, that you uh, follow that through. So if you'd just like to uh, fill in the uh, four question survey as you lead, um, the replay will be available in uh, about an hour's time. And uh, we're gonna be back next week looking at proactive customer service. So just like to say thank you to our speakers. Uh, Peter, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jonesy. And uh, John, thank you for visiting us, uh, visiting us so early on uh, what for you is a very busy day. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Andy. And thank you to each and every one of you for, who've joined us. And we'll be back next Thursday looking at proactive customer service. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Cheers, bye. -bye. Yes, bye.